Hi, everybody. Um, just welcoming you to what's new um, with my friend and colleague, Amy. I'm just going to do an introduction. My name's Mona, and I'm the director of the Pharmacy Fellowship Stream. So Amy is a pharmacist from Saskatchewan with over 15 years of experience, primarily in acute care settings. She typically divides her time between being a clinical pharmacist at uh, Saskatch Saskatoon St. Paul's Hospital. Uh, she's currently on educational leave uh, with our BCCSU Fellowship, and as an information support pharmacist with RX Files uh, Academic Detailing Service. She's, she has recent experience with supporting clients with chronic pain management, as she was involved with establishing the University of Saskatchewan's USAS Chronic Pain Clinic, which started as a pharmacist-led initiative with grant funding from the SUAP grants. With a passion for patient safety, along with the provision of quality pharmacy care, Amy also sits as past president on the board for Saskatchewan's licensing and regulatory body for pharmacy professionals. So welcome, Amy. This is a very interesting topic. So looking forward to hearing more. Great. Thank you, Mona, for that introduction. And welcome here, everyone. Thanks for taking time out of your day to join us this afternoon. Um, before I dive in, just want to acknowledge or expand on my background a little bit, just to acknowledge that I am uh, a third generation Canadian of European descent. Uh, I'm a cisgendered female, I'm a pharmacist trained in Western medicine. And so I think despite my best efforts to always check my bias, I know that there are some things that I carry with me regardless, so just wanted to acknowledge those at the forefront. Um, as I'm going to be going through and talking about testing the limits today, looking at novel synthetic opioids and Canadian drug checking, uh, I've got a number of slides to go through, but then I hope to leave some time at the end. So please feel free to throw any questions that you have into the Q&A box, and we'll try and leave some time for that discussion at the end. And uh, first of all, just to acknowledge that I am uh, a humble guest on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. I tried to show you on this picture where I'm located uh, within Canada. I know many of you are probably joining from BC. Uh, just in terms of a bit of context, the 2021 census data indicated that while BC had the second highest total population of people identifying as Indigenous who were responding to their census, Saskatchewan had the second highest uh, in terms of total proportion of residents. So 17% of Saskatchewan population is identifies as indig Indigenous. And wanted to acknowledge that colonialism continues to impact folks today. Indigenous folks carry a dispor disproportionate burden of the substance use uh, harms. And um, I'm committed to reconciliation and doing what I can through my work in order to try and address these. Very briefly for disclosures, Mona gave my introduction, but just to say that I'm funded through publicly funded programs, nothing is privately funded, and I have no relationship with commercial entities. So breaking from tradition just a little bit before I go into the learning outcomes, I wanted to bring forward this case report, which was published earlier this year out of Norway. So they described a young man who experienced respiratory arrest at home and required CPR for 25 minutes before the air ambulance arrived. He ended up receiving naloxone with good effect. He had a 0.8 milligram IV dose of naloxone. He regained consciousness. En route to the hospital, he required another 0.8 milligrams of naloxone and in the emergency department, another 0.4. So he received two milligrams of parenteral naloxone with good effect. He described using opioids that he had purchased from an acquaintance, um, but when they did testing with their standard immunoassay, looking at urine results as well as serum specimens, um, there were no results, no positive results. And even when they sent for a specific mass spec analysis, there were no initially, initially positive results. And my question to you is, are you surprised? We're going to come back to this case a little bit later as we go through the presentation today. So I would have said what my expectation would be based on the current context about around the market in Canada is that I would have anticipated that fentanyl would have been present in the young man's um, urine or blood specimens. And this is what we've been seeing in Canada between 2012 to 2022. This is not news to most of us. Synthetic opioids, namely fentanyl and its derivatives have been on the rise. And um, this is driven 
by um, a number of things which we'll get to further in the presentation. First, just a pause here. I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, you will come away knowing just a little bit more if maybe you knew nothing before about what nitazine opioids are and how that might influence the clinical care that you're offering to patients if you are a clinician, as well as then to tie in looking at the strengths and weaknesses of different drug testing or drug checking instruments that we have available to us in Canada. And a brief outline, I felt we needed to go a bit through drug market history in order to understand how we got to where we are today. Then I'll provide an overview of benzimidazole opioids, namely the nitazines, discuss briefly how to respond to opioid toxicity, and then go through some of the strengths and weaknesses of drug checking technologies and finish off with some clinical implementations or implications. Okay, so going way back, first of all, to 1975, so this is a picture of Dr. Alexander Shulgin, who was a chemist through the 60s, uh, even active still into the 90s. He became a bit infamous, I'd say, for some unorthodox methods that he had for studying psychoactive substances. He published an article in 1975 in which he said, the authorities assume that the drug abuse situation has reached its fullest degree of complexity. And he went on to say that logic would demand then that the solution to the problem is in identifying the materials involved, constructing an adequately worded prohibition, and then having sufficient force or enforcement to guarantee these prohibitions. In the same article, he went on then to say he forecasted that a large scale move from heroin to a heroin surrogate seemed economically inevitable. He said he argued that as the importation control into North America grew, grew stronger, without a corresponding decrease in demand, that the drive to create alternative methods that are not opium dependent would continue to grow. And he suggested that the largest potential was within the class of synthetic opioids, and he even went so far as to name in this article fentanyl, as well as the nitazine opioids, which I'll speak to further. And this makes sense when we look at a changing drug market perspective, looking at the labor supply required when we move from uh, substances from a natural origin to those of a synthetic origin. So you can see on the left that traditional opiates rely on plant production as well as a large group of farmers and have a long supply chain to, chain to actually get to the retailers at the end. Synthetic drug manufacture offers quite a few benefits to criminal groups, namely there are shorter supply chains, they don't need to rely on growing plants, these can be manufactured rapidly and inexpensively, and there's a reduced risk of detections because they're easier to conceal and they don't have to cross as many borders to get the product to the end user. So these are some of the reasons why we're seeing an increase in synthetic opioids over time. You might have seen the term new psychoactive substances, and this incorporates opioids as well as other substances as well. The definition technically is a substance that has the potential to induce psychoactive effects and that has been identified in unregulated drug markets for the first time. So typically these are chemical structures that are similar to traditional drugs or of abuse or that pose a public health threat. And they're often designed to be perceived as legal substitutes of scheduled compounds, because what's scheduled can be different from country to country. Sometimes these are marketed as legal highs or research chemicals. So as shown here as uh, infographic from the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, there has been an ongoing increase in the number of new psychoactive substances available on the growing, uh, global market between 2010 to 2021 going from 162 up to 618 in 2021, of which 87 of those were new uh, substances in 2021. And this further breaks it down into the different types of classes. And I've highlighted with a circle here, the opioids, the synthetic opioids. This has been one of the fastest growing classes in recent years. And of course, this is concerning because this is probably the group with the highest degree of toxicity and most potential for causing harm. The novel synthetic opioids are often categorized into one of two groups, one being fentanyl and its analogs, two being non-fentanyl structured compounds. So within this second umbrella, there are a few different compounds 
And today I'll be talking about the two benzyl benzimidazoles, otherwise known as the nidazines, easier to say, and then also the benzimidazolones. Today I'll talk about morphine, which falls under this category. Now it's important to note that most of these are not actually new. Many of them were synthesized many, many years ago by medical chemistry researchers or the pharmaceutical industry, but were never brought to market for a variety of reasons. And um, most commonly, I would say in this category, the toxicity of these and the potency of these medications are the reason why they weren't brought to market. So this shows, uh, again, from the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, their early warning advisory in which they have published the number of unique fentanyl analogs and nidazines, which were reported to the UN between 2012 and 2023. The top, a little bit darker line, is the fentanyl analogs. And we started seeing them in 2012, and they have grown in terms of unique number of analogs each year, peaking at 58 in 2020. When we look at what was happening in the environment around that time, besides just COVID in 2020, um, in 2019 and in 2020, the China, who was largely uh, responsible for development of precursors and exportation of fentanyl products, they put a ban on the exportation and production of fentanyl. At the same time, the US was trying to crack down on fentanyl. And they, as a result of different measures, we started to see the introduction of other synthetic opioids. So this bottom line shows us in night, the nidazines in 2019, there was one that was identified, which has grown to 13 in 2023. I think this number would be quite a bit, or would be higher now, I shouldn't say quite a bit. But in this context fits with what's called the iron law of prohibition, which suggests that as law enforcement becomes more intense, the potency of substances also increases. So in 2019 there, that was when a nidazine called isodonidazine was first identified in Canada. There was a fatality in Alberta as a result. And soon after it began being identified in other uh, places within Canada, as well as the US. This was an analysis that was published by the CDC in 2, the um, Center for Disease Control. They were looking at their routine surveillance data that they had of fatal drug overdoses, which was collected through the Tennessee State Unintentional Drug Overdose Reporting System. So they searched through their database to look for a cause of death which involved nidazines over a course of three years between 2019 to 2021. You can see that there were a total of 52 fatalities related to nidazines. There were zero in 2019, 10 in 2020, and 42 in 2021. And all of these um, involved multiple substances. However, the nidazines which were identified in 2020, it was primarily isodonidazine, and in 2021, primarily metanidazine. It's important to acknowledge this is likely under, under detection of these substances as a result of some of the challenges that we have with detecting nidazines, as I will discuss. Okay, so what actually are nidazines? So their full chemical name is 2-benzyl benzimidazole opioids, also called novel non-fentanyl synthetic opioids. These work very similar to the opioids that we are most experienced with seeing. They are selective mu opioid receptor agonists, they come with both analgesic and adverse effects similar to all other opioids. It was first synthesized in a Swiss pharmaceutical research laboratory in the late 1950s, and they identified the three nidazines listed oh, on the screen here. Adenidazine, clonidazine, and metanidazine. They did some preliminary, maybe ethically questionable studies on humans, um, in one, they gave a one milligram subcutaneous dose of metanidazine to volunteers, in which one out of five of them experienced respiratory depression and cyanosis, and one had complete respiratory failure warranting opioid reversal. So they ended up with all of these deciding not to study them further because it seemed that their adverse effect profile and addictive liability was no better than the other opioids which were available. And so it was never approved as medicine. The first two, adenidazine and clonidazine, already in 1961, were placed on the Schedule I list of the United Nations Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs because of high physical dependence producing uh, capacity. So this just briefly shows you the chemical structure of morphine, fentanyl, and the nidazine core. 
You don't have to be a chemist to know that these all look different. So they are structurally different. Um, wanted to highlight there's three R positions on the nitazine core at which you can put a number of different chemical entities to create their own unique chemical compound. Uh, so this one just lists 14 different nitazines using this nitazine core with different uh, chemicals on the end positions. And small changes in their chemical structure can result in differences in their opioid receptor um, selectivity as well as potency and toxicity. So in terms of effects, some people have described nitazines as having the potency of fentanyl with the duration of heroin with the actual euphoria to go with it. And they have reported, some have reported having stronger or longer lasting highs related to nitazine use. There's a wide range of forms available. They've been found in powder, tablet, liquids, many different colors. I've listed just a few, but the list goes on. Uh, they seem to be fairly lipophilic compounds, which means that they're well absorbed through mucous membranes and tend to cross the blood-brain barrier fairly easily, and also can contribute to erratic um, or unpredictable oral absorption through the GI tract. That being said, it has been reported to be taken by the oral route, intranasal, intravenous, um, vaporized, sublingual, quite a range of routes of administration. It may be mixed with other psychoactive substances, used to fortify or strengthen the effects of other substances, and also used in counterfeit, uh, counterfeit products on their own. This study done by Vandeput and their colleagues was published in 2021. Here they looked at the relative potencies of a variety of nitocines compared to fentanyl in vitro. So there's 14 different nitocines, which they ended up being able to categorize into four category, categories. The first one at the top being 20 times higher potency than fentanyl. There's two substances listed there. Then there's one and a half to 10 times higher potency than fentanyl, four substances listed there. And then the bottom two categories are between two to 10 times lower potency or 12 to 50 times lower potency than fentanyl. So still, you know, some of those being higher potency than morphine, most of those being higher potency than morphine, uh, though lower than fentanyl. I also just wanted to highlight that even low doses of these products can lead to toxicity and death. And also the asterisk beside three of these compounds. So we don't know a lot about the pharmacokinetics or the breakdown of all of the nitazines, but the ones with asterisks are metabolites of isotonitazine, which is a fairly common one. It metabolizes into N-desethyl isotonitazine on the top row. So its active metabolite is more potent than the original chemical itself. Transitioning briefly, because you'll also hear about borophine, sometimes in the same breath as the nitazines. So I just wanted to highlight that it's slightly different in that it's considered to be a benzimidase alone opioid. It's structurally similar but different to both fentanyl and isotonitazine. It was first synthesized by chemists in 2018 and then already like within a year and a half reported in the unregulated drug market. So that just kind of goes to highlight how closely illicit drug manufacturers are watching what's happening in the medicinal chem literature. Um, it is less potent than fentanyl, typically considered to be more potent than morphine. And not very common, though, when isotonitazine was scheduled in the United States in 2020, there was a slight blip in morphine use at that point in time. And sometimes it's sold as fake oxys or purple heroin. So each country has different scheduling. And I think like that's sometimes what people are trying to optimize or get around, find the loopholes with regard to scheduling from country to country. This isn't the case within Canada. Here we have the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, which lists the benzimidazoles under Part 13 of Schedule 1 of the CDSA. And um, they indicate that all nitazines and morphine are controlled under this list, even though they're not specifically listed based on their core structure. So all nitazines are scheduled controlled substances within Canada. How common are they? Not an easy question to answer. But I have provided here the Health Canada's Drug Analysis Service, which uh, receives samples that are collected or seized by law enforcement across the country. They have probably the most sensitive technology that we can get access to within Canada. So I 
I trust that if anyone was going to find these substances, they would. Um, I've listed here by year the number of nitazine samples which were identified by the Drug Analysis Service between 2020 and 2023. And now just for a bit of context, this is based on approximately like just a little bit over 100,000 samples tested per year across Canada. This is how many they've been finding, a max of 1,293 in 2022, and then a 38% decrease to 2023 of 803 nitazines. I also wanted to highlight that when you go to the website, you can look at across Canada, and then you can also break it, break it down by geography. 90% of the nitazine samples identified in 2023 were actually found in Ontario and Quebec. There were none where I am in Saskatchewan, and in BC, there were eight identified. Looking a little bit more granular in the Drug Analysis Service data, this is in for just the year of 2023. Again, this is a total of over 100,000 samples. I pulled out the three most frequently identified controlled substances, no surprises here, cocaine, methamphetamine, fentanyl. And then comparatively, looking at the nitazines listed on the right-hand side, metanitazine was the most commonly found nitazine, followed by protonitazine, both in the 300 range. The ones with the red asterisks are ones that were newly identified substances. And to highlight that at least the first two, I couldn't find potency on the last one, but the first two, uh, n desethyl isodonidazine and n pyrilidino protonidazine are higher potency by up to 20 times more potent than fentanyl. So all the more reason to um, be looking for these substances and know how to respond to nidazine toxicity, even if you don't know that that's what's causing it. So then quickly, just to, instead of just focusing on Canada, one is that the global drug market is rapidly evolving. What they've seen in the UK, in Europe, there was actually a ban on opioid production in Afghanistan in 2022, 2023, which has impacted their drug supply. So they're starting to see increases in synthetic opioids across the pond there as well. In BMJ, they had an article in 2023, the headline reads, the illegal drugs market is changing, is the UK prepared? And then in the Lancet earlier this year, nitazines heralding a second wave for the UK drug-related death crisis. They unfortunately reported 54 deaths in latter a six-month period related to nitazines alone in post-mortem toxicology and indicated it's likely the tip of the iceberg because many tests are still in process and emerging drugs are not routinely tested for. So what do we know about responding to opioid toxicity? Not a lot. This is something that we're learning as we go. I feel like this is a, a gap in the literature that this article is trying to fill. It was something published in 2023 by Amaducci and colleagues in NAMA Network Open. They um, took an ongoing multi-center study in the US which is investigating non-fatal opioid overdoses called the Toxicology Investigators Consortium Fentalog Study. And they looked for adults who were admitted to the emergency department with a presumed opioid overdose. And they included them if they had their discarded waste or blood specimens, and if they fell into one of two groups, the exposure group being those who were positive for a novel potent opioid, which they named as borphine, isodonidazine, metanidazine, and n peperidinyl adenidazine. And they compared that versus the controls, which was only positive for fentanyl. Uh, one thing to highlight is the exposure group had the nitazines, plus they could have other things in them, and, and they all did have other substances in them. What they did was they gathered information from the EMR to support a primary outcome looking at the number of naloxone bolus doses that were given and the total cumulative naloxone dose, which was administered in milligrams. So they screen, screened through thousands of folks and ultimately only ended up with 20 people that met the inclusion criteria. There were 11 in the fentanyl group, and then two each for the others in the nitazine or borphine, with the exception of n piperidinyl adenitazine, which had three. So very, very small sample size. Uh, but, hopefully, but I think we can still draw a little bit of clinical data from this. First of all, to acknowledge the fentanyl group had one outlier for a person who received 24 milligrams of naloxone. Otherwise, they didn't tell us a lot of detail about how much naloxone 
was given to the folks in the fentanyl group. But one thing to highlight is that all of those, most of those individuals received only one dose of naloxone. They responded to it, and this was given before being admitted to the emergency department. Remember that brorphine is less potent than fentanyl. We saw in the results here that these folks also only received one dose of naloxone. They responded to it. Here, the cumulative dose was one milligram uh, given. Concerningly, in the metanidazine group, two folks, there were only two folks in this group and they both presented with cardiac arrest and required CPR. One responded to naloxone, one did not, ended up needing intubation, ICU admission, but ultimately ended up passing away despite receiving six milligrams of naloxone. And the total cumulative naloxone dose um, given here was eight milligrams. So it was just a very high level summary with some very small preliminary data. But I think this still at least shows us that naloxone is effective for nitazine and brorphine toxicity. And uh, the thing is that we need to be prepared to uh, give multiple doses if need be and to educate others on the same. So coming back to our case that I introduced at the very beginning, where I told you about the young man who had an opioid overdose, but had tested and had responded to naloxone two milligrams given parenterally, and had tested negative with their initial specific mass spec analysis. They had heard there was a drug alert put out by the European Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addiction, where they had heard about nitazines being available in the drug supply. And in this article, they said, where there is a strong suspicion of drug use, clinicians should not settle for a negative result. So they continued, they persisted with the lab and they asked for a specific mass spec analysis um, or a broad sub substance, I should say, a broad substance mass spec analysis to look for all synthetic high potency opioids that they could think of. It took two weeks for it to come back, but it did end up coming back with protonitazine and some of its metabolites in both the blood and the urine in very, very small concentrations, suggesting uh, either that it metabolizes very quickly or that it's very high potency, could be uh, both of those things. But with this information, they were able to send out alerts to the public and to the community to inform them of this risk. So with that, I'm going to then transition into talking about proactive detection and drug checking. How can we, as we know that the drug market is becoming more potent over time, what strategies can we use to identify these substances before it gets to the point of opioid toxicity? When we look at the ideal testing, it needs to be effective for identifying compounds that have similar structures to one another. It has to be sensitive to detect low concentrations and also has to be accept accessible to members in the community. It should use small samples and deliver fast results. And for the following slides, there are two articles that I've referenced at the bottom of this slide here. If you're interested in this, I'd highly recommend you looking close, more closely into those articles. I've pulled from them as we move forward. Okay, fentanyl immunoassay test strips. This is very commonly available, uh, quite easy to do. Take a little bit of your sample, mix it in with some water, dip in your test strip, give it a little bit of time. It's going to either give you a one line, which is yes, positive for fentanyl, or two lines, which is no, not positive for fentanyl. So some strengths to this is that it can detect very small amounts in the matter of 20 nanogram per mil of fentanyl, delivers fast results in less than two minutes, relatively inexpensive. So these cost between a dollar to a dollar 50 per strip quite accessible, easy to distribute these, easy for folks to use, and it use, consumes a small sample uh, amount that so you need about less than five milligrams to uh, accurately test. Limitations are that it doesn't quantify the amount. So it's either a yes or a no answer, that's all you get. It also doesn't specify analogs, so you don't know how potent the fentanyl is if it's in there. And it doesn't detect all analogs. So for example, car fentanyl might not show up on the fentanyl tester. There's the possibility for false negatives and false positives. Um, the sample that you test cannot be used by the end user. And unfortunately, nitazines will not be detected because they are structurally different from fentanyl. So just because you get a negative fentanyl test strip does not mean it doesn't contain a potent synthetic opioid. 
Then moving ahead to the Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, which we call FTIR, because otherwise it's a mouthful. This is a picture here from Toronto's Drug Checking Service. And going into a little bit of the detail, I'm not an expert in this, but I understand it works by shining infrared laser at a sample and then measuring how that light is absorbed. Another, the nice thing about it is it's fast. You can get your results in less than five minutes. It uses a small amount of samples, similar to the amino acid test strips. It has a very large reference library. So there's over 15,000 substances in the FTIR reference library. And it can detect up to six substances within one uh, sample. The test sample can still be used after it has been tested, which is another benefit. Now, in terms of limitations, it doesn't like it will quantify the amount of each substance within the sample, but the amount that it gives is a range and it's an estimate. So it won't necessarily be accurate. Some models are not portable. I was reluctant to put this on because some people have gotten uh, creative where there's mobile vans that drive around with an FTIR machine and a laptop inside where they are able to make these samples. Uh, the FTIR will not detect a substance if it's not already in the reference library. And the big limitation here is it only detects substances that are more than 5% concentration. So since nidazines are so potent, small amount, they're often found in less than 5% concentration. So nidazines may not be detected with the FTIR machine. Now to pause here to say that in most cases, FTIR and test strips combined are, I, my understanding is that's what's being used in most places across Canada. So big limitation that our current strategy isn't going to necessarily pick up nidazines. Paper spray mass spectrometry is a novel uh, technology that is, as I understand it, is only being used currently by substances drug checking program in Victoria. It uses a high spray ionization or paper spray ionization method that uses high voltage to produce and then sort dry ions. So its strengths are that it's fast, you get results in two to five minutes. It uses an even smaller sample than FTIR and the testing strips. Uh, it can detect multiple substances and it can detect novel substances. So they don't have to be within the library in order to be detected by the paper spray mass spec. Very sensitive. So in the range of the picogram range, which I had to look up, is a trillion of a gram it can detect. And it's quantitative, so it tells you how much is in there. So it can detect nitazines. Limitations being that it's a big machine, it's heavy, it's not portable. So I understand they might be in research and development for trying to find something that's a smaller portable mini option, but it's not available at this time. The sample that they test is not usable. You need quite a bit of training to use this. The machine is expensive and it's only available in one center across Canada. So uh, great results, but quite limited in terms of accessibility. I wanted to show you some results. So this is the Substance Drug Checking Program out of um, Victoria publishes their weekly results. And you can find these easily online. I've prov provided the link to this specific one between March 25th and 31st of this year. They checked 153 samples, 59 contained down or opioids. Two of them they expected to contain protonidazine. They actually contained isotonidazine and metanidazine. And concerningly, for some of the other opioids, there was one that they expected it to be hydromorphone. It ended up being isodonidazine. And one they expected to be oxycodone ended up also being isodonidazine. So the paper spray mass spec is able to uh, pick this up in Victoria. OK, then wanted to just go through the surface enhanced Raman spectrometry. As far as I'm aware, um, this has been field tested, but I don't know if it's being used at this time. I wasn't able to find that information in Canada. But what it does is it shines light at a substance, and then the scattered light indicates a compound's chemical fingerprint. So its reported strengths are that it's portable, uses a small sample. It's quite sensitive in that it can detect about a 1% concentration, fast results in a matter of less than 10 minutes. And if the nitazine is listed in its library, then it can detect it. The limitations being it can't detect those nitazines that aren't in the library. Uh, the sample that we use is not usable. 
And the biggest limitation in my mind is it's a new technology. So as far as I'm aware, it's not readily available at this time. It takes about three hours training in order to use. And I'd say the machine is perhaps moderately expensive. Uh, there might be some on this presentation who are able to add some context around this in our discussion period, but this shows promise to me. We'll see how things kind of grow over time. And then finally, nitazine immunoassay test strips actually are available on the market now. They came out at the beginning of 2024, similar to fentanyl test strips. You know, you can get your results within one minute. You use it the same way as a fentanyl test strip. One line is positive, two lines is negative. These are relatively expensive. They're about twice the price of the fentanyl test strip, so about $3 per strip. And a limitation is that they won't capture all nitazine. So this is still preliminary, but there has been some independent evaluation, which suggests the ones that are listed in the red on the bottom, there's five nitazines listed there that would not be detected by a nitazine test strip at concentrations of less than 3,000 nanograms per mil. Okay, so in terms of drug checking services, I wanted to just do a really quick overview of, of what's out there. Uh, I would say, and I don't live in BC, so I can say this, but I would say BC has the most robust drug checking program uh, within Canada. Um, the BCCSU has a drug checking project, and what they do is it, it's a provincial pilot which partners with other harm reduction organizations across BC to help implement and then evaluate community-based drug checking services. I've listed their website here. They've got a really nice video on the website that talks about drug checking and the value behind it. Um, you can also click on your region that you live within to find some local drug checking for yourself or for the people that you're serving. Um, and then a couple others that stood out to me when I was doing my research for this presentation. Get Your Drugs Tested is based out of Vancouver. It's a medicinal uh, cannabis dispensary in Vancouver, you can go into their storefront, you can mail in uh, samples, and these would be tested with FTIR or test strip. I've listed their website here. And then on the island, we've got the Substance Drug Checking Program serves Victoria and area. You can go into their storefront in Victoria. You can also mail in, and they've got some partners. Uh, they're, again, using some of the more advanced technology in terms of checking substances. So this isn't all of the drug checking services, just some of the, the key things I wanted to highlight. And I want to thank Jen Angelucci, who works for the BCCSU Drug Checking Project, who provided me with this data around nitazines in BC. So you can see between 2021 to 2023, there was a total of 55 nitazine samples, which were identified through drug checking. Uh, in 2021, there were three deaths from protonitazine that were reported as part of that 12 that were checked there. Um, two of the samples in 2022 were believed to be benzodiazepines, but they ended up being nitazine. And I oh, just wanted to say like this is excludes some data, like things like from festivals or uh, mail-in samples because they're not able to verify where they come from, but just like base level numbers that we're capturing with drug checking data. And also to say, this is likely, again, the tip of the iceberg, because if we're using FTIR for checking, there's likely to be quite a few nitazines that are not meeting that 5% threshold for being captured. This is some recent, these are some recent results from the Get Your Drugs Tested. You can go onto their website and find their test results archive. So this is just within the last couple of months. On April, what would that be? April 10th there was a sample brought in that was a yellow powder, which they thought was a benzodiazepine. They did testing on it and found it to be de n des ethyl isovernitazine, which again is from that highest potency uh, fentanyl, relative to fentanyl category. It was negative on the test strip for fentanyl and benzos. Uh, other things we can see here within the last couple of months, there were substances brought in that they thought was hydromorphone, oxycodone, pitizolam, heroin, all of them tested negative on fentanyl test strips. All of them tested negative for benzodiazepines. And the notes suggest that they couldn't identify which specific nitazine it was with the technology that they had. Just enough to say that these samples shared structural or shared similarities with nitazines, suggesting that they might be nitazines, but couldn't say for sure. 
Looking across Canada, I would say Toronto's drug checking service comes in at second place in terms of how robust it is. I hope I don't offend anyone by saying that. Uh, but they have access to FTIR and test strips, but they also have off-site drug checking capabilities, so they can send samples off for mass spectrometry testing. And the other thing that I really like about Toronto's drug checking service is they have something called a drug dictionary. So each specific substance that they're identifying, you can go and find information about that substance. So here, for example, a new nitazine, protonitazapine, was first identified in Toronto on March 6. 2024, it's uh, thought to be 20 times stronger than fentanyl. So really would encourage you to check out that drug dictionary if you have questions about the specifics of nitazine. And then some other drug checking services across Canada. To my knowledge, all of these are using FTIR and test strips. A few in Alberta, some in Saskatchewan. Prairie harm reduction is what we have here at home in Saskatoon and then some in Winnipeg, and then what I listed in Montreal. I know there's more than these, but I just wanted to highlight some of them. Okay, so in terms of we can check drugs if we, we have um, a system in place in order to find out what's actually in the substance, I would say the second part of that needs to be to communicate that information out to the public about what's available in the, in the supply. And, um, this is an example, not from Canada. This is actually from Australia in January of this year. The drug warning came out from the government saying that there were Red Bull tablets being sold as MDMA or ecstasy, which did cause multiple hospitalizations and ended up being identified as having no MDMA and contained nitazine. So these alerts are important to let folks know about what's out there. Back home in Canada, this is a drug alert that came out on March 18th in Toronto. So they noted there was an increase in suspected opioid overdose related deaths and that Toronto's drug checking service had recently identified two new high potency opioids. This is the one that I showed the protonitazapine was one of the ones on the drug that I showed from the drug dictionary example. Um, so just letting folks know about what's out there. And then perhaps some of you had seen this one which came out on March 27th in Vancouver, counterfeit hydromorphone was identified as containing protonitazine and metonitazine. Um, and so uh, that was available through the board, the heart alerts. So it's one thing to get the alerts out there, but then how do we make sure that people actually know about the alerts? So within BC, you've got access to the toxic drug and health alerts, which are available by text. So you can text the word JOIN to the number 253787 or alerts and these will be sent directly to you. It's more than just drug alerts. You can also get information about overdose prevention sites and harm reduction supplies and naloxone. Uh, but I think it's a great thing just to kind of be up to date with what's being communicated out in terms of alerts uh, within the community. And then I listed, since I'm in Saskatchewan, I listed we do have a drug alert system that was just started at the beginning of this year. I've only received two alerts to this point, but I just think it's good to be taking strides in that direction of getting um, and I didn't put on this slide, but Toronto's Drug Checking Service also has alerts that you can sign up for as well. So coming down the home stretch here, some considerations for practice. Uh, as we know, the drug supply, there's no indication that lower potency opioids will start to become available on the market. It just seems to be going higher and higher. And so we need to be in a position to help people to make safer decisions and to use substances more safely. So it becomes about harm reduction, counseling folks about synthetic opioids, what the potency is, the contamination in the supply, and the limitations to the testing that we have available. When using, have others around, so whether that's using safe consumption sites or overdose prevention sites. There's a couple apps that people can get access to if they have availability of the technology, whether it's the Brave app or the Lifeguard app. And then we also have the National Overdose Response Service, which is a virtual safer consumption hotline available 24-7 Canada-wide. And then as clinicians, but also people who use drugs, we need to recognize the signs of opioid toxicity and that we may need to use more naloxone than has traditionally been used and be mindful that polysubstance use can impact the clinical presentation as well as the findings and the response to the naloxone. 
Uh, and if you are a clinician and you're sending a serum or a urine to the lab for confirmatory mass spectrometry testing, you can ask to have nitrogen added to that confirmed testing to get that information back. System level change. Um, unfortunately, stigma continues to be a barrier to drug policy innovation. Some provinces more than others, perhaps. Um, we know that drug policy and enforcement and stricter scheduling have not gotten us to where we need to be at this point and might have actually contributed to the, what we're experiencing today. And so we need to get creative about strategies both to detect novel substances and then also communicate these risks to the public. Finally, lots of considerations for future research. This is continually a moving target and lots of things changing all the time. But if we can better understand both the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties of novel synthetic opioids, as well as to look at drug checking technologies that are adaptable, accessible to people, and also sensitive for small concentrations of high potency, high potency substances. And then finally, looking at effectiveness of opioid agonist therapy as we use ultra potent opioids moving forward. So I went through a lot of information. I provided you with my references here at the end. And I just wanted to pause, first of all, to thank you for taking the time out of your afternoon to join me in this presentation, but also for the support that I received through BCCFC for this presentation. Jen Angelucci and Jenny Matthews are both members of this project. And so thank you very much for the information you shared, as well as Mona Kwong for the support and the help with this presentation and getting me to this point. And with that, I will open it up for any questions or discussion. I think Jen and or Jenny might be on the call. So if you have anything that you wanted to add or, or correct of anything that I communicated, your, your comments are certainly welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amy, for the talk. Lots of good resources here. Some that were new to me too, so that was great. Um, so we can open the chat for questions and you can also verbally ask some questions of uh, the audience even uh, or of Amy. Thank you. Yeah, and just feel free to throw your chat, your questions in the chat or raise your hand if you want to make a comment. Any questions from anyone? Jenny, I see you in the crowd. Did you have anything that you wanted to, would you like to expand on the BCCSU drug checking project at all for any context? I think we're good, Amy. Um, if there's more questions, well, you're welcome to, um, send in questions a bit later on too. Or Jenny, did you want to say something there? Oh, you're just on you're just on mute. Just seeing what there's typing here. I don't know if you wanted to say something, Jenny. The oh I have to unmute you. Oh uh, there we go. Now I, now I can unmute. <laughs> okay. okay. Oh, yeah, no, thank you so much, uh, Amy. It's really um, super interesting information on the nidazines that you put together. I think uh, definitely welcome information in the drug checking community here in BC. And uh, I really, you know, um, I know Yana is on here as well from Fraser Health is one of the um, drug checking leads in that region. So I think that's uh, really important. And even though we don't necessarily see nidazines in the same frequency as some other regions, I think it's we know we know uh, that it is a part of the complex picture here. And uh, really, uh, we, you know, we see them co-occurring with other potent opioids. So um, it's just really uh, a challenge you know, for people who are trying to find ways to be safe and for uh, healthcare providers trying to support them. So. Thanks again for that information. And I'm also happy to help answer any questions around the drug checking um, um, in BC. Uh, there's a lot of health authorities and uh, 
community organizations that operate drug checking services in the province. And we've seen a real scale up of that service over the past uh, few years. Uh, and we're really uh, you know, excited that we can help make that more accessible across the province. Thank you. Do you or does anyone know if the surface enhanced Raman spectrometry is available in Canada? Uh, Raman is available, but I think, and I'm, I'm going <laughs> to send this out to the more technical folks, um, but I think that it wasn't chosen for some specific reasons and um, you know, sort of in the review, the, the the new new technologies document was really about um, emerging technologies that still haven't been tested in the field. So even with test strips, what um, while the uh, the test strips can you know operate really well under sort of controlled conditions, as soon as you sort of enter in the sort of wild drug supply that we have, there's just a lot of uh, things that are sort of unintended, un unknowns that we kind of come across. So we really want to make sure that those things are tested in the field as well. Um, thanks, Jen Angelucci just said, uh, yeah, UVic at uh, Substance was using uh, this, the SERS, but they've preferred the PSMS um, technologies. And I think the thing to know about community-based drug checking too with FTIR and test strips is that in BC, those services, a lot of them also not all of them, but a lot of them have access to, in some cases, DAS, as well as the PSMS for secondary analysis. So, you know, technicians are able to kind of filter those results, uh, you know, those samples that might need additional um, analysis. So it's just a way of making sure that we um, can get some of the trickier ones and analyzed by the more sensitive uh, equipment. Thank you so much for that context. I'm glad we have experts in this area. <laughs> There's a lot to know. It's excellent. Thank you. There is a question, detox from nitazines. I'm not sure if that's a, if I'm to answer that. Maybe you could expand on that question if you'd like me to answer that. Oh, half-life. Yeah, we don't, um, as far as I'm aware, there is no pharmacokinetic or pharmacodynamic data on the, these substances at this point in time. I wasn't able to find anything other than saying that they're fairly lipophilic. That was about as, as much as I got. So I don't know anything about uh, half-life. Though, like, you know, users' experience being longer duration of effect than Fentanyl, perhaps a little bit longer of a half-life, but I'm completely surmising that. I do not know that. Any other questions? All right, well, hearing no other questions, again, to thank everyone for taking the time out of, out of your day. I hope that there was some useful information for you here and uh, really appreciate uh, having you here and having an opportunity to speak to this, this topic. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. <laughs>